Hello. I am. It's just not very loud, is it? Hello. Brother Russ, could you turn me up just a just a touch, not a whole lot. Are we uh are we on live? Okay, now can you hear me better? Is that a little better? Okay, let's stand to our feet. <clears throat> and um, I'm sure you will know this song if you don't. I, what page was it, Miss Sure? It's page 249 if you need a book, hymn book. 249. 249. 249. <clears throat> Father, we love you, we worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name, glorify thy name, glorify by thy name in all the earth. earth. Jesus, we love you, we worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the Glorify thy name, glorify thy name in all the earth. Spirit, we love you, we worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name, glorify thy name, glorify thy name in all the earth. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Well, amen. That was great. You guys, you did good. You may be seated. That's good. Well, are you glad you're here tonight? Well, amen. It's been a good day, and um, I believe God's got a word for us tonight. We, um, yes, sir. We do have outlines. Yes, where are they? Oh, I'm sorry. But uh, a couple of y'all, Kim, Penny, would y'all maybe grab those and pass those out. Last Wednesday evening, I just started teaching from the book of 1 Thessalonians, and so I want to go back there tonight, just pick up where we left off. And um, 
I just felt like that this book, this teaching is very appropriate at this time in our lives and it's about encouragement and being encouraged and encouraging one another. So tonight I want to share with you the for being an encourager. There are several essentials that's necessary if you are going to be an encourager. Now, I'm going to ask you this question, and I want you to give me an honest answer. Have you encouraged someone today? Well, at least he was honest. No. <laughs> yes. Have you encouraged someone today? Let me ask it another way. Be honest now. Listen to this. Has anyone today encouraged you? We are to be encouragers to one another. In 1 Thessalonians, the first chapter, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, I'll begin reading in the fifth verse. Follow closely now. Look what the Scripture says. Look closely to what Paul is saying. Verse 5. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word verse 8 For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Achaia but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declared concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Oh, amen. You got a pen or pencil, you ought to underline there in verse 10. Even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. The Thessalonian believers are among the most encouraging believers that are mentioned in all of the New Testament. They were a bunch of folk that just loved encouraging others. Well, I could stop and camp right here for a good while tonight because my prayer is that that same thing could be said about Mildale. That people would want to come to Mildale. People would, would say about this body, this people, boy, that church is an encouraging bunch of people. I'm going to tell you something. That's what we need right now more than any other time. We need to be encouraged. And that's what was said about the church at Thessalonica. Paul says there in verse 8, that their faith in God 
has become known everywhere. What a testimony. The testimony of this church was spreading and everyone was saying about the people at Thessalonica, boy, they are a bunch of encouragers and, and because of their faith, we're hearing about the Lord. I wonder how many people in recent days have heard about the Lord because of the work that's being done at Milldale. Everywhere Paul went, he actually came in contact with believers in Christ who had been encouraged by the people at Thessalonica. Now, did you hear what I just said? Everywhere Paul went, he would run into somebody that had been blessed because of the encouragement of the believers at Thessalonica. I believe this. Wherever I go, wherever you go, we ought to run into people and when they find out and when they see my shirt or when they recognize my face, my prayer is that whether I'm at Walmart in Zachary or Walmart in Central, I pray that people would say, wow, we've been hearing great things about Mildale. Man, what God is doing over there at that place. You all believe we need to have that kind of testimony? I do. I really do. A big part of God's purpose for every one of our lives here tonight is to be like the believers were there at Thessalonica. Be like the Thessalonians. Just let me put it another way. God's plan for every one of us is that we be encouragers. I want to take that a step further. I believe God's plan for us at this hour, at this moment here at Mildale, is that not only are we to be encouragers, but we are to be a part of the body of Christ that goes around building people up and not tearing people down. Thessalonians had three characteristics. There was three things about the people there, um, about the Thessalonians that uh, identified them as being a people of encouragement. And I want to give you those three characteristics tonight. Let's examine our hearts and let's examine our lives and our church tonight and see if we, if the testimony that's been spoken of the Thessalonians could be the testimony that people could say about us. The first characteristic that could be seen in the Thessalonians is this, and well, listen to me, if we're going to be encouragers, we've got to come to the place in our lives where we must appreciate the Word of God. We must appreciate the Word of God. Now look what Paul writes in verse 5. There in verse 5, Paul says, Our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power and with the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. The Thessalonians, they had a deep appreciation for the Word of God. I mean, here was a church of people, they love God's Word. They love studying the Word. I wonder, am I describing us tonight? Are we a people that love to study? Are we a people that likes to dig into the Word of God? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13, listen to what it says. This reveals the fact that they love the Word. It says in verse 13, We also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth the Word of God. Man, they welcomed it. Why? Because they understood this precious book did not just simply come by mere man. No, they understood that the Bible came from the very heart of Almighty God. 
Yes, men wrote this book. But let me tell you something. Men didn't just sit down and write their opinion. They didn't write their thoughts. I believe the men who wrote the Bible were men who were inspired by a holy God. God, I believe, guided their thoughts, but I also believe God even guided their hands as they began to write the book that we call the Bible. Amen? Now, here's what I love about the Bible. The gospel that's actually contained in the Bible is not just a bunch of words. The gospel that is contained in the Bible, yes, it's made up of words, but watch this, I believe this, those words are accompanied by power. I'm telling you, friend, there's power in the Word of God. There's victory in the Word of God. The, the word translated power, Greek word dunamis, it means force. Would you agree that there's some force in this old book right here? That word dynamite also means, listen to this, it also means miraculous power. There's miraculous power in the word of God. God promised that his word would not return what? Void. But it would accomplish what he sent it to do. I'm telling you tonight, that's why we need to stand on the promises of Christ our King. Why? Because there's power in the Word. Amen. I pray that you're standing on the Word. The Word of God has awesome spiritual power. Hebrews 4 and 12 even proves it. I said it has awesome spiritual power. And in, in Hebrews 4 and 12, it says it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of our hearts. There's power. Amen? Now, I said that to say this. There are going to be times in your life, my life, when we need to be encouraged. There's going to come a day, there'll be a time in your life, my life, when we need moments of encouragement. And guess what? Sometimes there might not be somebody around to encourage you. Amen. And so when those times come when there's nobody around, maybe, maybe it's in the midnight hour, or maybe it's during the day and there's no one around, and, and so you find yourself, you're down in the dumps. I mean, you've been attacked from every side. Where in the world do we go? What can we do when there's nobody? I believe it's times like that when we as the children of God need to go and pick up the Word of God and say, God, you know how I'm struggling. God, you know what I'm going through. God, I desperately need to hear a word from you. Amen. And this I can say with 100% absolute certainty. This precious book will never steer you wrong. Amen. You know what I like to say, and I've used this illustration a lot of times down through the years, but um, I, I, I probably, I go through Bibles quite often. They start to come apart and I don't know how many times I've super glued this one back I just hate to retire it <laughs> I got all my notes and things written all in my Bible and, and guys let me just say this because somebody asked me this the other day they saw my Bible and they said oh you write in your Bible <laughs> I sure do 
I do. I write all in it. When God speaks, if I don't write it down, I'm liable to forget it. You know, you know how I see the Bible? You know what this is to me? To me, this precious book is God's love letter to me. And I'm telling you, listen, I personalize it when I study it and read it. And it's just like God wrote this just with me on his mind and heart. Absolutely. So we need to cherish the word of God. And I'm telling you, regardless of what you're going through, it does not matter what it is that you are going through. You can go to the word of God and this precious word will bring encouragement to your heart. You'd be surprised. You know, listen, there have been times I've been so down I didn't know what else to do, didn't know who else to talk to and just go close the door and get in the word of God. And I mean, wow, there it is. God hits me right between the eyes. And it's the very thing that I've been searching for or praying about. That brings encouragement to your heart. Amen. So we need to turn to the Word of God. I'll give you an example. If this don't bless your heart, nothing will. But don't forget what I'm about to say. The next time you need encouragement, I challenge you. Take your Bible and turn to Psalms 119. Did you know that Psalms 119 has been called a devotional book of the entire Bible? A devotional book of the entire Bible. Psalms 119 has 176 verses. Wow! It's the longest chapter in the Bible. And all 176 verses, either directly or indirectly, refers to the written Word of God. All 176 verses in Psalm 119. Well, did you know there's a prayer in Psalm 119? In Psalms 119, and it's the 28th verse, I believe there's a prayer right there that we ought to pray before we ever open the word to study. Now watch this. I'm going to read it to you. Psalms 119 and verse 28, this is a prayer. It ought to be a word of encouragement. It says, my soul melts with heaviness. So strengthen me according to your word. Amen. Amen. How many times have you been there? My soul, it melts from heaviness. Sometimes we're just burdened down with the weights of the world. Sometimes we've just been bombarded from every direction. Don't think we can take another step. And that's a prayer. God, would you strengthen me? God, would you speak to me? God, would you encourage my heart in this moment? I promise you, you get into the Word, the Word gets into you, and it's amazing how quickly you forget what it was that you was burdened down with. <laughs> Do you know why Satan doesn't want you to get into the book? I'm sorry? Okay. That's right. He doesn't want you to know the truth. Many years ago, one of my mentors, godly man, W.A. Criswell, was sitting in my office, and he said, Son, let me see your Bible. And he took my Bible, and he flipped to the front of my Bible, and 
he said, mm. he said, get you a pencil or pen. So I got it. He says, I want you to write this in the front of your Bible. So I wrote it. And I refer to it nearly daily. You know why, God, you know why the devil doesn't want you to get into this book? Here's why. Listen what Brother Crystal had me to write. He had me to write in the front of my Bible, this book will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the book. Boy, there's truth in that. This book, the Bible, the source of our encouragement, it can keep us from sin, but if we're not careful, we will allow sin to keep us out of the and then we wonder sometimes why we're about to crush under the weight of the world. Mm, mm, mm. So we got to get into the Word and pray. My soul melts for, from heaviness and strengthen me, Lord, according to your Word. Well, when we get in the Word and as we begin to gain comfort and Courage and contentment from his word. Guess what? We will start to appreciate the word of God more and more and more. God, God doesn't give us power to just simply for our own benefit. God's not going to just simply bless us with the power of his word just for my own selfish benefit. Watch where I'm about to go with this. God blesses me with encouragement when I get into his word so that I am now equipped to be an encourager to you. Does that make sense, folks? If all I do is go around and all, if all I ever do is just give out and give out and give out and give out and give out, I'm going to finally get to the point where I'm running on empty. I don't have nothing to give. So I've got to receive. Watch this. I've got to receive so I can give. Have you been receiving today? In 2 Corinthians, let's look there. Turn to 2 Corinthians real quick. In 2 Corinthians, the first chapter. 2 Corinthians, chapter 1, look at verse 3. 2 Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation. Why? that we might be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Wow. God wants to speak to us, and God wants to encourage us, and He wants to, watch this, He wants to fill us up. Why? not just so we keep it to ourselves and hoard it to ourselves. No, he blesses us with blessings from above so that we can go out of here tonight and be a blessing to somebody else. Amen. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 11.1, 1, write that down, but let me read that because I know this is going to be a very familiar passage of Scripture to you, but I want you to... Understand what the scripture is saying here. In Ecclesiastes chapter 11 in verse 1, it says, Cast your bread upon the water, for after many days you will find it again. Middle Eastern bread, they, 
their bread, a lot of the Middle Eastern breads over there kind of look a little bit like our pancakes. They're round and they're, and they're flat and, and they're very, very light. You can almost take a piece of bread in the Middle East and you can almost throw it like a Frisbee. But watch this. The writer of Ecclesiastes says this. You take that bread and you cast it into the sea. And it's out there. If you remain faithful, the current, the waves, will bring it right back to you. Uh Uh-oh. Listen to that again. Cast your bread upon the waters. For after many days you will find it again. So that means that if we will encourage people, church, watch this. I want you to get this. I want you to do this. I want you to put this in practice tonight. If we encourage other people, if we are known as encouragers, and you keep on encouraging, you keep on encouraging somebody, and when you see somebody that's down, and somebody that's can't even hardly hold their head up, it seems like they're just dragged. Listen to me. You go to that person, and you give that person a word of encouragement. You give that person a pat on the back. You say to that individual, regardless of what you're going through, regardless of the valley that you're in, we're here with you. We will be here to cheer you on. Encourage one another. Listen to me, because the day will come when you will be in their shoes, and then that person then will have an opportunity to come to you and say, come on, hold your head high. It's going to be all right. Cast the bread into the water and you're faithful. It won't be long. That bread will come back. Cast encouragement upon one another. I promise you, it will come back. Anybody in the room know what I'm talking about and experienced it already? You know what I'm talking about. Watch this. Again, I believe this with all my heart. You got to give in order to receive. I receive from the Father, but He gives it to me so that I can give it to you. He gives me more so I can give it to you. He gives me more so that I can give it to you. That's the way it works. If He blesses you and you hold on to it, He blesses you and you start hoarding it up. It's not the way God wants His people to be. Don't you ever forget. And I believe this goes, this can be applied to every aspect of our lives. In order to receive, you must first give. The Bible is just simply filled with encouraging words. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 says, Whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Wow. Well, Satan knows that. Satan knows that. So when you get discouraged, and I have personally experienced this already this week, did you know that you get discouraged 
first thing that the devil wants you to do is to have some bad thoughts about your church. And then he ups the ante, and then not only does he want you to have bad thoughts about your church, but he wants you to have bad thoughts about your pastor. You know why that happens? Hold on. I know that Brother Jimmy is sitting here. I know Brother Danny is sitting here. But I know that they will agree with this. You know why that happens? You know why the devil fills your mind with so many negative thoughts about the church and your pastor? Because Satan does not want you going to a church that preaches the truth. doesn't want you to be in a church that stands on the word of God. Are y'all listening? The person who is behind the power that's in the word of God is the Holy Spirit. Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the power that's behind the Word of God. Amen. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts us. It's the Holy Spirit that enlightens us. It's the Holy Spirit that transforms us. It is the Holy Spirit that brings comfort to our hearts. Thank God for that. Amen. And I believe he drives the home. He drives home the truth. And he drives home the reality of God's precious word. That's why Paul and several of his associates, they preach the gospel with such deep conviction. I, uh, Paul is one of my all-time favorite preachers. He preached the truth. He just simply preached the truth and let the chips fall where they may. Amen. That's the kind of preaching we need today. You know why Paul could do that? Paul could do that because he had the assurance of the word of God. Paul understood that the word was truth. He understood that the word came from God, him. Self. So if we're going to be encouragers, anybody in the room tonight want to be an encourager? If you want to be an encourager, you've got to learn to appreciate the Word of God. And then let's move on. Secondly, if we're going to be encouragers, this one might surprise some of you. If we're going to be encouragers, we must duplicate faithful believers. We must duplicate faithful believers. Look at verse 5 again. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake, and you became followers of us and of the Lord having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. Oh, more than anything else, the people that we choose to model, the people that, that, that we would choose to imitate will affect the quality of our Christian lives. Now, I want to, I really want this to be clear to you tonight. Every man and every woman needs to have a model in their life. Someone that they look to. Someone that they learn from. I'll be the first to tell you the greatest model in all the world was Jesus. He's the only perfect one. 
that ever walked the face of the earth. And so, I believe that every one of us here tonight, this is a good group, by the way, listen, I believe every one of us, our greatest desire should be this, I really want to be like Jesus. I would love to think the way Jesus thinks. I, I really would like to do the things that Jesus did. Uh, a bunch of these guys I had Bible study with them Monday night. Remember what we talked about? What did Jesus do? Walked on water. And they all said they wanted to walk on water too. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen closely. Jesus makes an interesting statement in John 13, verse 15. And this is what Jesus said. He says, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Whew. There it is. Jesus is stating that I have left you an example and, and you should do the things that I have done to you. Yeah, but Pastor... Jesus was God in the flesh and the blood, in flesh and blood. And he was perfect, and let's just be honest, preacher, we're not. True statement. But Jesus is still the main one that I want to follow after. But now listen. I believe that we all need human models who would be someone that would encourage us in our Christian faith. We need people that we can come underneath their wings and learn from them. Anybody here ever made a mistake? <laughs> <laughs> okay, at least we're honest. Now let me ask you another question. You find another person that has been a Christian for several years more than yourself and they've matured and they're growing in their walk with Christ. Do you think it's possible that we could learn by sitting down with someone that's spiritually older than us and learning from those folks? I wonder, hmm, I wonder if, um, did you do everything that was perfect when you were raising your children? Now this goes... More from right now for younger parents that's got still small children. But watch this. You know, sometimes it wouldn't hurt for young parent families to sit down with much older, mature, to ask questions. What did you do? How did you raise your children? The ones that amaze me are people that wanted to give me advice down through the years, and they never had a child. <laughs> I can't tell you, young, when I was young in the pastorate, I, I, you know, I'd have you know, single people come tell me, well, now, if I was his dad, this is what I... Boy, I just want to say... <laughs> no, I'd go find a dear friend, Charlie Gibson, who'd already raised his children and ask for advice. Are y'all following me so far? Let me tell you something. Young married couples who are struggling in marital problems at home need to find a godly man and woman that's been married for 40, 50, 60 plus years and go sit down and just soak it up. Find out the success of their marriage. We can learn from one another. Amen. Come on. I said, we can truly learn from one another. Paul understood this. 
He really did. That's why he says in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17, Brethren, join in following my example. Wow, this is the Apostle Paul. He says, Brethren, join in following my example. And note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Paul said, hey, fellas, just watch me, follow me, do the things I do. You come and follow me as I follow Christ. Mm. We all know what a pattern is. Um. Patterns can be used in sewing. I guess they still... I remember my mama 100 years ago, you know, she used to go buy them little packets and she'd pull all that up and had... And she'd pin that thin paper to cloth or material and then she'd cut it all out. And she had all these awful looking... It was amazing how when she got it together what it looked like. I, I got a dear friend, he, he, he loves woodworking, and boy, he makes some of the finest pieces of woodwork I've ever seen in my life, and man, I was just amazed at his handiwork until I discovered his secret. He traced everything off on plywood. <laughs> and then he'd cut it out, and he would put it together. Let me tell you something. Here's what the Lord showed me. God gives us patterns for a reason. And if we'll pay close attention and if we'll follow the pattern, our jobs will be easier. It, the job will be faster. And I about shouted when I got this one. When I follow a pattern, fewer mistakes will be made. <laughs> Woo! Fewer mistakes will be made when we can just learn to follow the model or the pattern. Every one of you, I don't care who you are, you learn quicker. You learn a lot faster when you follow a pattern. Again, Paul knew this. In 1 Thessalonians, look what he says in verse 5. He says, you know how we have lived among you for your sake? You became imitators of us and of the Lord. They became imitators by imitating what Paul did, the things that Paul did. And watch this. They were able to grow on to the point in their lives when now they were to be imitators of Christ. But it all began take new baby Christians. They don't know how to live. They don't know what to do. So they need a good example. They need a good example in their lives to follow after. I'll never forget the short time I had with Dr. Criswell. He taught me so many things. I mean, he always told me, he told me things that I never thought of. Dr. Criswell said, before you go out every Sunday, son, it's, <laughs> he says, look down and make sure everything's locked up. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought about that. He said, son, be sure you got good breath when you go out there. I thought, my soul. Hey, but one woman out there I'm wanting to kiss, you know. I mean, <laughs> he said, don't you ever go out in that church without some mint. You have good breath. I said, but why? He said, because in that invitation, the Holy Spirit's moving. He said, and they come up for you to pray and for you to counsel with them. You don't want to pass out because of your dirty breath. <laughs> It's just the little things in life that I didn't think about. He said, no pastor should ever have all under his fingernails. That's why 
why I keep mine down to the quick. I don't want no oil. <laughs> I tell you what, God put me with W.A. Crisple for a short season in my life. But I'm going to tell you something. It was valuable. It was valuable. Who do you walk after? Who is the example that you follow after? Mm. Because of the preaching and because of the lifestyle of the Apostle Paul and some of his buddies, the Thessalonians became Im imitators of them and of the Lord. Now listen, that word imitator is where we get our English word mimic. Mimic, imitator, mimic. It's important for us to mimic. It's important for us to learn from. It's important for us to follow after or in the steps of older faithful believers. I'll be honest with you. When um, when Milldale called me and asked would I be would I consider coming here, and I said I pray about it. I, I would love the idea of coming to Milldale. And wasn't long after that, Brother Jimmy called me, and you know, Brother Jimmy started this church, 1963. Being the gracious, godly man that he is, Brother Jimmy said. Now, Pastor, if it'll make things easier for you, I'll step aside and I'll go find another church. You know what my response was? Absolutely not. I've admired that man for many, many years. That's a godly man. And I just think what a privilege it would be to be able to go and get up under his wings and let Brother Jimmy teach me some more. Because let me tell you something. You don't get too old to learn. Now, I don't like that old statement, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I don't like that. But that's okay, because I'm not an old dog. <laughs> I'm still a young pup. Brother Jimmy's just a mature. I don't want to use, use the D word. I'm scared to go there with that one. But, uh, you know. <laughs> Woo, Brother Sonny said it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Well, maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking, you know, Pastor, I don't know anyone that I respect that much. Could it be that maybe you're expecting too much from a model? Maybe you're just expecting too much. Let me tell you something. There's no perfect models anywhere. Not one perfect one. I don't care who you look at. I mean, you can look at Brother Sonny. <laughs> and if you, <laughs> if you look hard enough, you're going to find a flaw. Ooh. You look at me, you're going to find a flaw. Look to Brother Danny, you're going to find a flaw. If you look to the person sitting next to you, you're going to find a flaw. But you know what my daddy taught me many years ago? Here's what my dad said, and I'll tell you what, this was one of the greatest things that my dad ever taught me. He used to say to me, son, don't get mad at that individual. Don't get upset at that individual because if you look hard enough, you'll find more good than you find bad. Amen. There's truth in that, church. There's good in everyone sitting in the room tonight. Amen.
Now, if you sitting here and think that you don't need a model to imitate, well, guess what? Pride's gotten in your way. Pride has gotten in your way. And the Bible says God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. See, the truth is this. We can learn from anyone. We can learn from everyone that is sitting here tonight. You know why? Because we all are ignorant. <laughs> Y'all didn't get that, I guess. We can learn from everyone in here tonight. We're all ignorant, just in different subjects. Don't talk to me about working on an automobile. I do good just to get the ignition key in there and turn the thing. And when it won't crank and when it dies, I just have to call for 911 because I don't know what to do. <laughs> Who was that out there last night that had the car, that had the alarm going off and we couldn't figure out how to shut the alarm off? And I'm telling you, it woke up everybody in the community. That was Peggy, wasn't that y'all's car? <laughs> Their alarm, listen, they, some, some of the youth come got me and said, Preacher, can you come out here and, and I said, yeah, you don't want me out here. I don't know, I didn't even know which end the, the motor was on in that car. I was a, it was a van, I had a hard time trying to, we can all learn from one another. You can learn from me, and I can learn from you. I wonder, are we doing that? You just need to know how to ask the right questions. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 5 says, Counsel in the heart of a man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. So we need to learn to draw from one another. I want to give you an example. You've got to learn to draw from one another. You could, if you're struggling with your time, why don't you just find somebody that knows how to manage their time and just say, would you teach me how to manage my time? Or maybe it was with your finances. You have a difficult time managing your money. Find somebody that knows how to manage money and ask for help. And the list can just go on and on and on. Listen to me. Don't be afraid to ask. Amen. Don't be afraid to ask. The believers at Thessalonica, in spite of their severe suffering, verse 6 says, they welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Joy is the part, it's one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit that defies human explanation. Amen. You became a model. Verse 7 says, You became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, which refers to all of Greece and Philippi and Corinth and Athens. That word model means you became an exact duplicate. Mm. What if we all became exact duplicates of Brother Jimmy, Brother Sonny, Miss Shirley? Boy, we'd have a powerful church here. You ever thought about that? Boy, I'd love to be able to play that piano the way Miss Shirley plays over there. I'd like to, I would like for her to duplicate that <laughs> in me. So, one of two things tonight, our lives either encourage people or we discourage believers. Our lives every day, we either draw people to Christ or we push them away from Christ. What are you doing right now? Are you drawing people to Jesus or are you pushing them further and further and further away? Who is your example? Who is the model that you keep your eyes on. That's the one final thing here, and then we'll get out of here. I want you to look at this. 
we're going to be encouragers, we have to anticipate Christ's return. That's what he ends with in verse 10. If we're going to be encouragers, we must anticipate Christ's return. Read verse 10. And we're to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath that is to come. Not only do we need to look back at Christ's first coming, he came in Bethlehem's manger, but now it's time for us to look forward to his second coming. Amen. The Thessalonians expectantly waited for the return of Christ. They truly believed 2,000 years ago that Christ was going to return at any moment. Well, watch this. It, they not only turned to the living and the true God, but they were waiting for his Son to come from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. They believed that Jesus would return at any moment. That's how they lived their lives. You know what's wrong with us? We still think we got lots of time. We're not like the Thessalonian believers. Because they believe, that, I believe this, I believe they were going about their daily tasks, whatever job the people were working on, I believe that they worked with their hands, they took care of their families, while at the same time they kept an eye on the sky. They thought that Jesus Christ was truly about to return. Well, he is, church. He is about to come. I have no doubt in my mind that he is about to return. You heard the news this morning, Sharon Perez had a massive stroke, and he's on life support. Said he was doing a little better this afternoon, but, but had a massive stroke, and now all of Israel is saying now that their, their only hope in Israel now is for the Messiah to return. And they're believing that the Messiah is about to come back to this old earth. Well, he will. He's coming. And we showed you Sunday morning when he returns from heaven. With the, he will descend with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. And what's going to happen first? The dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive will be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And what is that referred to as? The rapture. I believe that's the next great event on God's prophetic calendar. Luke 17, 34 says, and on that night two will be in bed, one will be taken and the other will be left. Why do you suppose Jesus put that in there? Letting us know that the rapture is going to be worldwide. Part of the world will be asleep. The other part of the world will be awake. One will be in the bed sleeping, but the other will be about their daily tasks, their work, when the rapture occurs going to be daylight on one side and dark on the other side. Two will be in bed. One will be taken. The other will be left. I wonder. We're all going moment. We're going to retire and go to the dorm and I hope have some peace. Last couple nights haven't been too peaceful around here. The sheriff of Milldale is going to be on, on the prowl tonight. I'm going to catch him. You got it. What if we go back there tonight and lay down and go to sleep and all of a sudden about 2 o'clock in the morning the trumpet sounds. Shoo! Will you be up there? Or will you still be back there in your bed? Mm. When the tribulation when the rapture occurs, it will usher in the great tribulation. At the end of the tribulation, Christ is going to return to set up the new Jerusalem, and the capital of Jerusalem. And he will rule and reign for a thousand years on this earth. Now, I show you this, and I'm done. I love verse 10 because it says that the rapture 
will save Christians who are living on this earth from the wrath that is to come. Do you know before God destroyed the world with a flood, you know what he did before the judgment came? He put Noah, their three sons, and all their wives into the ark, and God closed the door. But everybody outside the ark, they died. Noah preached for 120 years, and no one gave their life to Christ. People said, that old man been preaching that judgments was coming? Well, I heard him preach that 50 years ago. Still hadn't rained. I have no doubt somebody said, well, Noah has been preaching that sermon for 120 years and had been no rain. They mocked him. They made fun of him. Crazy man building a boat out in the desert where there had no rain. There's not even a pond. Man done lost his mind. Guess what? Rains finally came. God said, I'm going to rain down judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah because their wickedness has come up before me. You know what the scripture says. But before the judgment of God came on Sodom and Gomorrah, God got his man Lot out. And when Lot got out, then the judgment Before the wrath of God pours out on this earth, God's going to take the bride out. And then the judgment will come. Think about this tonight. I want you to go to bed and I want you to think about this tonight, guys. I keep saying guys. I'm sorry, ladies. <laughs> you too. From the creation... To the flood was 2,000 years. From the flood to Jesus was 2,000 years. From Jesus ascending into heaven to the year 2000 was 2,000 years. God created the world and everything that's in it. He created it in how many days? He did it in six days. And he rested on the seventh. The Bible says that a thousand years is the same as a day. So really and truly, Adam and Eve was on the earth just six days ago. They talk about the world being billions and billions of years old. No, it's not. Nah. At most, at most, the earth, the universe is only about to be 7,000 years old. Listen to me. I don't believe that we know the day and we won't know the exact time. But here's what he did say. You will know the seasons. This is encouraging to me. Six days. It's behind us. We are in the beginning of the seventh day. Get ready because our redemption draweth nigh. Hmm. I pray that you're ready to go. Any prayer requests before we go tonight? Anybody got a prayer request? Yes, sir.